Hello again and welcome to another 140k build guide tactics video. Now before we get into today's video I would like to say a huge thank you to Sam Williams for sending in some awesome pictures of his Imperial Guard tank company. I really like the third party bits that have been used on these tanks. Makes them look really cool and unique. And amazingly, Sam actually makes these and sells them. So what I'm gonna do, bit of a community spotlight video here, guys. I'm gonna put some links down in the description below. And if you need some extra third party Lehman Russ turrets, or you just like the look of these and want to convert your existing Lehman Russes over into this new style, then please check out those links below. Absolutely fantastic models, really, really just great detail and everything. And I've actually got some of these that Sam sent to me, and I'm going to be using them for my tanks going forward because I need to change a few of my weapon loadouts. So, really helpful to have those extra turrets. So, massive thank you to Sam for sending these pictures in. And if anyone else has got any pictures they want to use in my videos, then please post them on my Facebook page or you can email them to me at mordiumglorytv at gmail.com. But without further ado, let's crack on with today's video. So today guys, I want you all to get your tinfoil hats out and make sure that the government can't read your brain because we're going to be talking about conspiracy theories. What we're going to talk about is, why is GW all of a sudden really pushing mechanised guard? Is it obvious or could there actually be a more, not necessarily sinister, but subtle reason that they're starting to push mechanised and armoured guard a bit more? Good job we've got some armoured guard pictures for today's video then, isn't it? Now... Some of you may be wondering, what do you mean Morning Glory? What, what do you mean they're pushing Met Guard? Is not Hybrid Guard better? It's not, you know, Infantry Guard better? What are you talking about? Well, until recently, Infantry Guard certainly was the better way to go with things like Hammer of the Emperor coming out in the previous data slate and the fact that we were entering this phase just utter lethality and the fact that 9th edition was very objective focused. It really felt like infantry was key and you were seeing that not only in Imperial Guard armies but you're also seeing that in a lot of other armies. I mean 9th edition truly is the addition of the elite infantry and infantry in general. You're not seeing huge amounts of tanks and vehicles. Those that you do see tend to be things like dreadnoughts which I would describe were almost halfway between a tank and a vehicle because well, A, they got legs, but B, they can do well in combat, whereas in 40k tanks traditionally don't really do much combat, they're kind of gun platforms. Now, like I said, infantry has been really key in 9th edition, especially for, you know, uh, Imperial Guard. And if you actually go back and look, about a year ago when I attended LGT, uh, I ran a, a mechanised guard force, and I didn't do very well, unfortunately. And the reason for that was it just felt like Mac Guard just didn't really play, they didn't really work well, they didn't have all the advantages that Infantry Guard had in 9th edition. But in the latest balanced data slate, suddenly we're seeing a massive push for Imperial Guard vehicle armies. I mean, from the simple changes to things like the CP, the, the fact that we're all starting to have less command points now means we can't take multiple detachments, and the best way to run Guard Infantry was to take like three battalions. You can't really do that anymore. The White Shield Army of Doom is literally impossible to run now. You could run it, you just can't run it with White Shields, and if you're not running White Shields, you're running regular conscripts, it's basically doesn't work and so we're starting to see armies and players really end up going down a more mechanized route and this is only emphasized uh, by the fact that um, you can fit a mechanized army in a single battalion you don't really take a brigade and also the fact that in the latest balanced data slate we got armor of contempt on every single one of our vehicles and even some of our bigger vehicles got things like a two plus uh, armor save on those bane blades and stuff now that's really really good and i'm all for it and i've had some great success with tank army already this weekend and i'm going to be doing a live stream today on the uh 27th of the 6th 2022 to talk about the after action report and then i'm going to be doing an after action report video tomorrow as well so keep your eyes peeled for that but Met Guard, Tank Guard really seem to be doing a lot better now there is a simple explanation for this GW could be simply writing the ship, trying to balance the game out and balance the faction out a little bit more. They've said, they've, well, they've recognised that infantry's been strong for a long time. They want to give guard their tanks back. They want to bring something that's weak and bring it up and make it more powerful. And that could be, it could simply be from a balanced gameplay point of view. And that, it could, that could be as simple as it gets. There could be no further strange manipulative reasons for them doing it. But... I know some people are, are going to say, well, actually, 
the reason GW does this, the reason why they're always mixing the game up and keeping it fresh, and now the reason why they're pushing guard tanks now is because they want to sell guard tanks. And this is an argument that comes up a lot of the time. It's like, GW's only buffed that thing because they want to sell them. Clearly they've not sold any Liam Rust kits in a while. Clearly they've not sold any Chimera kits in a while. They want to push Chimeras, they want to push Lehman Russes, they want to push Guard Armour, and so that's why they're making them better. Because now all those Guard players that got into the game over 8th and 9th edition, who maybe were really focused on buying Infantry Squad after Infantry Squad, are now no longer going to be able to you know, want to use those units, they're going to have to go out and buy a whole new set of models that they never originally attended to do, intend to do so. And that is an argument you can make, but I'm not certain. See, that's like partial tinfoil hat right like you've got the first layer of tinfoil on but if you really want to go down this rabbit hole and this is a little mad guys it's a bit of fun but it kind of weirdly makes sense so get your full roll of tinfoil out wrap your whole self in it get the space blanket out line your walls with it because i think there could be another reason why gw has started pushing vehicles and pushing tanks and like I said, guys, this is a bit of a fun, a bit of fun this video, so don't take it too seriously. But my thinking is, is that this is their response to third-party alternative models, not bits. Bits like what we're seeing on today's video on these pictures. Bits are fine. I mean, the base hull of this tank is a Lehman Russ, and you have to go out and buy a GW Lehman Russ to really then add the extra bits on. GW doesn't really care about third party bits. They don't really care if you've had to go and you know buy a load of Anvil industry heads and stick them on top of your Cadian Garden. They don't care. And why don't they care about third party bits? Because they've already made their sale. You've had to add things on to the base unit. They've already made their sale, so they don't care. Yeah, they could maybe make a bit more money by selling their own head swaps and all that kind of stuff. And maybe that's something they'll do in the future. But right now, they don't really care about that because as long as you're that you're buying their base product, you can strap whatever the hell you want onto it, right? Now you might say, well, what about the rules for Warhammer World and all that kind of stuff? That's a little bit different. Like that's their flagship sort of place, and I kind of get that. And same with like their GW stores. But in terms of you going to a non-GW event, they don't care if you've got third-party bits and They don't care because, like I said, they've sold their base model, and that's all they care about. However. There is a big market, a huge market out there at the moment for third party alternative entire Imperial Guard infantry models. Hell, I did a video on this recently. I'll link it at the end of this one where I talked about how to get cheap guard infantry. OK, and I pointed out like War Games Atlantic is an entire company who's almost pretty much entirely built off the fact that they sell alternative guard models. They've got alternative Mordians and Destroyers, they've got alternative Praetorians coming out, they've, re they've recently released the Cannon Fodder set, which is like the most affordable way of getting your mass infantry guard army. And GW has kind of accepted that they can't compete, or they're unwilling to compete with, with that. I mean, you can buy one squad of guardsmen, one squad of Caden guardsmen for like 30 quid, or veteran Kriegers, for 35 quid. That's 10 guys. Or you can buy 30 from War Games Atlantic for I think 25. It's it's cheaper. And you can turn up with those 30 guys or more and no one will care. You can turn up to an, any tournament out there and no one will care. You can turn up to any game out there and no one will care. Because guess what? An infantryman is an infantryman at the end of the day. It doesn't really matter what he's using. And the, and the Imperial Guard is such a diverse fighting force. And there's so many different patterns of lance gun and uniform and everything that you can't really say anything. And as long as, you know, it's the infantry model is the same scale as a guardsman, then there's no modeling for advantage or anything like that. And tournaments and game groups I tend to be a lot more accepting of alternative infantry models. They don't care. You know, if you, when you explain to them, your mates, oh, well, I got 30 of these War Games Atlantic blokes, 30 quid. Why the hell would I spend 90 quid for 30 GW? They're going to go, yeah, great, great, great bargain there, man. No worries. And you don't even need to get your models approved before you go into a tournament because the tournament here is going to be like, yeah, it's an infantryman. I don't, I don't care. Like, crack on. However, that is an entirely different story when it comes to tanks. You see, whilst most people will accept the third party infantry model, most people will feel a bit funny or not be entirely okay with and tournaments especially could very much just not allow it an entirely different third party vehicle model 
because vehicle models are just different. Maybe it's hard to explain, but a Lehman Russ has to look like a Lehman Russ. It has to be clear for your opponent what he's shooting at. And also, it has to be clear what weapons it's armed with. And more importantly, it has to be the right size. If you've got a Lehman Russ that is bigger or smaller, either way, it could be claimed for modeling for advantage. And if you're on a top table, you just can't, you just can't have that. And so, by DW focusing people on guard more and focusing people on mechanized and armored guard more, what they're doing is they're drawing people away from that third party market. They're encouraging people to instead buy their GW models because they know that third party tanks are way, way less common and way, way less accepted than third party infantry. And that is my crazy conspiracy theory. They've decided they can't fight the third party sellers with you know bringing their own models down. But what they can do is encourage their fans and encourage their player bases to have to buy GW armies that rely upon GW models. That's my crazy conspiracy theory. Now there's another side to this conspiracy theory as well. There's another layer to it. This one is a little bit less wacky and could almost be its own sort of separate thing. But basically, I think another reason why GW might be encouraged people to go down the tank route is it's cheaper for them to get into guard with tanks than it is them to get into guard with infantry. Now that might not make sense. You might go, but of course GW would want you to buy the more expensive army. Not if it gets to the point where the army is unfeasible or unrealistic to get it from Games Workshop. If you were to buy a 200 to 300, let's say 300 guard infantry from Games Workshop, because that's how many you'd need to have a little bit of redundancy, and maybe sometimes you want to run them as all concerts, sometimes you run them as all infantry squads, but you know, 300 guys is about the norm, right? That's what you need to have a fairly future-proof guard infantry army. If you were to buy that from Games Workshop, that is literally like a thousand pounds, especially you know, it's it's almost a thousand pounds. It's thirty unless you're going down the cash chain route, but then you're still looking at like six hundred odd pounds, and you've got no weapon option. So yeah, no, it's a thousand pounds at least. Even if you go down Games Workshop Brood Brothers and you use you get the heavy weapon teams with them and all that kind of stuff, you're looking at you know a thousand pounds. Let's say you get 20% off that. You're looking at 800 quid. You get 20% off because you get it from a third party retailer or you actually, you know, that, that's kind of it basically. 800 pounds is prohibitively large amount of money. And the problem with it is that it also takes a, it takes a long time to build up a 300 guard army. It's a lot more models to build. It's a lot more models to paint. Those models take longer. I can knock out a Lehman Russ tank uh, in about an hour to an hour and a half distractedly if I want to paint a guard infantry squad to the best of my ability it can take me a week on and off okay so tanks are just you know they take they're cheap they're, they don't take anywhere near as long and they're cheap now how are they cheaper well if you wanted to run the list that I ran at a tournament this weekend which was with 10 Lehman Russes each of those Russes cost you about 35 pounds okay that's just 350 quid that's not that expensive. That's not that prohibitive at all. Maybe you want to get a few more Russes on top of that. But either you could just get your 10 lean Russes from GW or you could get more and get them for 20% off. E either way, the army instead is like 300 to £350. Pounds, new. From GW. It's, it's not that expensive. It's still... A, <laughs> we're talking relatively here, of course. I very, you know, I am... I'm sure when I say £350 pounds is not expensive, there's going to be a lot of people that go, oh, morning glory, Mr. Moneybags. No, no, of course, £350 pounds is a lot of money. Don't get me wrong, guys. What I'm saying is, relative to spending £1,000 pounds on an army new from GW, £350 pounds is a lot less prohibitive. It's a lot less restrictive for people getting into it. And then you can get your 20% off. You can get, you know, and suddenly now you're looking at having like a 300, you know, a less than £300 pound army. That's really, really good for brand new from GW. There's very few armies out there which you can spend, get brand new from GW and spend less than 300 pounds on these days. And that you could get built and painted so quickly. You could get, if you just took a week off work, you could get built and painted a 10 Lehman Russ army in about a week. You could probably get all the Russes painted in one weekend. Okay, like I, when I'm painting my Armageddon Steel Legion tanks, I literally spray them with Zandri dust. I do a bit of silver and black and stuff on the weapons and tracks and whatnot, and then I wash them in uh, Seraph and Sepia, and they're done. 
The longest part is waiting for the wash to dry. It's really, really quick. So tanks are way less prohibitive, way less expensive. So suddenly, when th you think of your consumer mindset, they're going to go, your consumer's going to go, okay, well, I can get the proper GW models. And they're, they're going to go from, I should say, I'm not spending 800 to 1,000 pounds on games watch models. I'll go to War Games Atlantic and buy 10 boxes for 190 quid or something crazy. Yeah, I'll do that much, much better. Or they're going to go from that to, oh, yeah, I could, I can get 10 Lehman Russes. I can put, I've got a couple lying around. I've got from my start collecting sets. I've got myself a couple from eBay, maybe. And then I'll just pick up five or six from GW. It only cost me 150 quid. If I get it from my local game shop, I can probably get it for about, you know, definitely for 150 quid. Wrap one, one rattle can and three or four paints later, we're, we're bloody done. Jobs are good. In. It's a lot less prohibitive. So unlike the situation where GW could potentially make a thousand pounds off an infantry army, but they never ever will because no one's ever going to want to spend that much on them. Instead, they're now going to definitely make 300 quid, 150 quid. That's 100 quid they literally just would never see before. And that's my crazy conspiracy theory. It's less prohibitive, which encourages more people in, which then means that people are now using more GW models and that's how GW is going to fight the third party retailers. It's crazy, but it could just be crazy enough as an element of truth in it. Isn't that the best part about any conspiracy theory? That it's crazy, but it just has that ring of truth to it. That it might just be true. And that's it for today's video. Now, if you've enjoyed it, please consider giving it a like, subscribe, comment, all that kind of good stuff. Any additional interactivity really helps with the YouTube algorithm. And if you've really enjoyed today's video, please consider becoming a channel member or Patreon supporter. It's thanks to the very generous support from the channel members and patrons that the Morning Glory channel is going from strength to strength. And to be honest, the fact that it's still here at all. So massive thank you to all of our existing channel members and Patreon supporters. And I want to say a quick thank you to all of our new and latest channel members. So I want to say thank you to Silent Warrior, Matisma Unuzi, Ayani Forever, David De Los Santos, Springy Shelf 6, Thomas Gilliam, Lincoln Games, Alex Hilton, Steve T, Commissar Drago, Tucker Swain, Alex Wargamer, JP Greer, Timothy Nadaretta, Bimo, Lee Whitehouse, R. Pate, and Bob the Jesus. Thank you all for signing up. It's absolutely incredible. I really appreciate support. And I also would be remiss of me not to mention the Patreon support. So massive thank you to our latest patrons as well. Gankistani, Ben Thorne, Alan Harfin, Marcus Roberts, and Timber De Jägermeister. Thank you to all of you for becoming channel members. It truly is really, really appreciated. Now, before we go, I want to say a special heartfelt thank you from all of our top tier Patreon supporters. I want to say thank you to Guardian Varney, John Stubbs, Nick Walsh and Swordfish Trombone for being signed up at the Lord General level, the top tier of Patreon support. Thank you guys, it's absolutely incredible. And I also want to do a special shout out to Diesel Fox, Shooter McGavin and Tom Sutton for being signed up at the Commissar level, another really high tier of Patreon support. Thank you, all of you. Now, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching, and as always, I'll see you guys next time.